All right, guys. So, um, as Pastor David said, this is the last week of this series that we've been going through, uh, Chasing Holiness. And uh, I don't know about you guys, it's been really good for me. Uh, one of the neatest things about, uh, about preaching and just in general and bringing the message week in and week out is, is uh, that God really works on you first. If you do it right, you know, God has really beat me over the head uh, all week long, sometimes all month long in preparation for these messages. Pastor Brian, who preaches in our equipment campus, we were talking about that just this week, how convicting it can be. And, you know, and, and in that process, and I'm so thankful that God, you know, uh, gets a hold of me first. So, so I want you guys to know that this is not just me telling you how to live. This is me sharing, you know, for, as, as one beggar to another what God, the, the, the rich uh, bread that God has blessed me with. And I, I hope to share that with you guys this morning. We've been talking about uh, chasing holiness and Paul. You know, uh, I've often said Paul, he's a, just an amazing writer, and how he kind of wraps up this, this, this last, uh, his last thoughts on sin and the law in chapter 7, and how he does this is really, really amazing. So I want you guys to see what here, uh, Romans chapter 7, verses 21 through 25, and we'll just jump right in here. It says, uh, Romans chapter 7, verses 21 through 25, it says, So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. And verse 24 says, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. I love this, and there's this quote by uh, Walter Elwell, and I think it really kind of sums up this whole passage for us. And he, he says this, he says, The believer already has a new nature in Christ, but he must express this nature in decisive acts of choice and perseverance and faithfulness that confirm that fact that while the old nature lingers, it must be daily repudiated as it wastes away. That's such a great picture of what's happening here in Romans chapter 7 is that, that we are, and, and, and if we are a believer in Christ, if we have a new life, a new nature, the, all the old things have been uh, have gone away and all the, all the, everything is new in our life. So we have this new nature in Christ and yet there's this thing, there's this, this flesh that still lingers on within us. And, and, and what the uh, author here, Walter, what he's saying is that, that we have to make decisive acts and choice and perseverance and faithfulness against that. To daily, our love is to repudiate as it wastes away. That's a word of day right there. So, you know, what's really powerful about this is what, and what Paul is going to talk about here uh, as we close out uh, this week is, is the, some things we need to know about ourselves and about the sin and about the law. And, and these are really powerful things. And so uh, the first thing I want you guys to see here is that when we chase holiness, there will be difficulty. Look with me here in verse 21 again. It says, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. When I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. You know, Paul, this is kind of Paul's dust statement in this. You know, I mean, we've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks. Paul is saying to us, you know, I want to do what's right, but I can't, or I struggle against that, you know. And, and But here's the amazing thing about this is that we go, we all go through this. We all struggle with this uh, calling, even Paul, you know, we have to realize that Every good work that we do, every good deed, everything that we do in service of Christ and pursuit of Christ is going to be a battle. And that's the thing. It, it's, it, we know already, we've already studied and learned that it's going to be tough. There's going to be a battle there. But what we have to really hold on to and realize, though, is that it's supposed to be that way. It's, not, it's, it's going to be that way. It's not just going to be that way, but it's supposed to be that way. That's how we know the good from the bad. That's how we know the victory from the defeat. It's when we know the difficulties that we face and that we've overcome. Look at Jesus makes it clear in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. And follow me. You know, we, we hear that passage and we've heard that passage many times before. And it's so funny because we don't really think about what that's saying. You know, because to us, the cross is something that we wear, wear around our neck, right? The cross is something we wear on a shirt or a bracelet. Uh, well, no, maybe we're not all that shallow, right? Maybe that's something we do. We wear our cross. And we, by the way, I'm not saying it's bad to do that. Maybe, maybe, the, maybe the cross is, for us, it's a symbol of, of, of grace. It's a symbol of power. It's a symbol of, of salvation, right? 
But it's so much more than that. You have to understand when Jesus was speaking to in those days, he's saying you have to take up your cross and follow me daily. Deny yourself and take up your cross. What he's saying is you have to take up this instrument of torture. You have to take up this tool that is used for capital punishment, this, this tool of execution. In other words, he's saying I want you to take up what's ultimately going to lead to your death. Leave yourself behind, take up this instrument of torture, and follow me daily. That's heavy stuff right there. This is Jesus telling us that's how it needs to be. We have to take up our cross. That's like saying, take up the hangman's noose and follow me. That's like saying, take up the electric chair and follow after me. That's not where we want to find ourselves, but that's where God is telling us we must go. It's a difficult place, and ultimately it may lead to our physical death here. That's what God said. When we follow after Him, it will be difficult, but it's supposed to be that way. It's not supposed to be easy. We talked about, you know, last, uh, the last couple of weeks, we talked about when Jesus Christ came and he, and he gave His life for us on the cross, He made the impossible possible, but He never said it was going to be easy. And that's where we find ourselves. The second thing I want you guys to see here is the spirit and the flesh are at odds. Well, again, this is kind of a dove statement, right? We've talked about this and we've gone over this. The, the spirit and the flesh are, are at odds. There's the spirit within us and there's this flesh within us and there's this battle, this ongoing war. But I love this, what he says. Look at it with me here in verse 22 and verse 23. It says, for I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. And you have to understand, this is not Paul making a statement or a declaration of, of defeat. This is Paul saying, I'm not going to be defeated. I recognize that there's a battle going on. There's, that, that, that my flesh is making war against my spirit. And I'm going to be a part of the spirit. I'm going to be a part of that that fights back. I'm going to be a part of that that makes a stand that says no more. So, so here's the thing I love. It says, he loves the law, for I delight in the law of God. So often it's, it's, it's hard for us to accept that. You know, we see something in Scripture that tells us a certain way that we should live. And we say, well, I've been living this way for so long. I don't want to change. I don't want to do, you know, I know that you're telling me that I need to do this. I don't know how many times I hear people come to me and say, I have a prayer request. I know the way that I'm living is bad. I know that what I'm doing is wrong. I know that it doesn't honor God. But I don't want to stop. And trust me, guys, I don't either. Nobody wants to stop. But the calling that God has given us is to fall on the right side, to chase after holiness, to do what He's called, to delight in the law of the Lord, not to fight against it, not to battle or to struggle against it. The third thing I want you guys to see here, we should be broken over our sin. Look here in verse 24. It says, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I don't, I don't, there's not much more of a descriptive passage in Scripture than, what's, than what Paul is saying right here. This wretched man that I am. You know, and it's so funny to think about it. You know, surely, surely Paul, the Apostle Paul, one of the great heroes of the faith, wouldn't call himself this wretched man. But that's exactly what he does. He recognizes his place. He recognizes who he is apart from Christ. And here's the thing. I, I love this quote. Um, it's by uh, R.C. Sproul. It says, Other people moan and lament and complain. One doesn't have to be born again to consider oneself wretched. But when Paul makes this judgment about himself, he is making out a sense of anguish and profound remorse for his sin. You know what, uh, what Dr. Sproul is saying here is that, that we don't have to, you know, there, everyone you know, comes to this place sometimes where they, where they recognize that they're a wretched person, but, but Paul is understanding in a specific context. He says, in comparison to who Christ is and what he has done, in comparison to that, I am a wretched man. I am far from God. I am a sinner. That's what he's saying. And here's the, here's the issue. Here's the problem, you guys. There's so many of us, and some of you guys in this room right now, you're probably saying to yourself, well, I mean, I'm not wretched. I mean, I'm a, I'm a pretty good guy. I'm a, I, you know, I, I help old ladies across the street, or you know, I, I try to do good things. I'm, I'm not a murderer. I'm not like those people. I, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a drug dealer or a, or a drug taker. I'm not, you know, I'm not that bad. 
And that's a lie from the devil. That's exactly where he wants us to be. He wants us to be in a place where we say, just like that, where we say, well, I don't really need that. I'm not as bad as all that. I don't really need Jesus Christ. What he whispers into our ears is the lie that we are not wretched, that we are okay, that inherently we're all good people. But the truth is, Paul comes to this place where he recognizes that he's wretched, that he's lost, that he's separated from God. And he's not the only one in Scripture. Psalm 22, 6, you see uh, David, King David, and we talked about uh, King David last week. He says, but I am a worm and not a man. This is uh, the David, a man after God's own heart, who recognizes his place in comparison to, to Christ. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5, it says, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And there it is again. When you see the King, the Lord of hosts, the, the God, the creator of the universe, the creator of me and you, the only response that we can have is that we are wretched. We should be broken over our sin when we compare ourselves to Christ's righteousness. It's not about beating ourselves up for our sin. It's about recognizing who Christ is and who we are in comparison. Because here's ultimately what happens is we need to know that we cannot do it on our own. Our wretchedness separates ourselves from God. We cannot do it on our own. You might be sitting here and saying, well, maybe you need all that, but I don't need all that. I'm okay. And that's exactly what's happening. We don't just need to be sorry, because here's what ultimately happens. You guys, you come and you sit in my office or Pastor David's office, and we talk about how your life is coming unraveled. And now you need Jesus, and now you need God. And here's, here's, here's what is tantamount happening. I know with my two boys, and especially my oldest boy, Michael's just now getting to that place where, you know, whenever I get on to him, he's not really sad that he broke daddy's rules, right? He's really more brokenhearted over the fact that he got caught. You know, he's really more, more brokenhearted over the fact that he got caught with his hand in the, in the snack jar when he's not supposed to be there. He's really more brokenhearted over the fact that we found him playing in the living room. It's like 11.30 at night and he should have been in bed for the last two hours. And he's just lives in there playing with his toys, you know. He's really more troubled over the fact that he got caught than over the sin that he committed. And that's where we find ourselves too. We find ourselves in our life becomes done, come unglued and come unraveled. We come to God, but we're more brokenhearted over the situation that we're in or the situation that we put ourselves in than the sin that we committed against God. But Paul, he doesn't take that approach. He recognizes he's brokenhearted. He calls himself a wretched man. He recognizes who he is. He recognizes that he's sinned against a righteous and a holy God. And he's, he's as, the, as this quote said, a, a sense of anguish and profound remorse for his sin. That's where he finds himself. And I love this next part of this verse. It says, uh, body of death. You know, we read this. He says, who will save me from this? Who will deliver me from this body of death? And here's the interesting thing about this, this word body or this phrase body of death. It's an idiomatic expression. You guys know what that means? No, okay. So, so you do, you know what an idiomatic expression is. I'm going to nerd out for just a minute, so you guys bear with me, okay? It's really simple. Idiomatic expression is, is, is uh, every one of us knows uh, what that is. An example of an idiomatic expression is running a red light. How many of you guys ever run a red light in here? Boom. First service, nobody fessed up. But I, I've run a red light before. I've never, like, pulled up to a red light, been in a hurry, and just drove through it. But I have, you know how, you know what happens, like, you're just not paying attention or something, and, you know, you pull up and there's a turn lane right here. The guy in the turn lane starts going and you're not paying attention. So you just go to and then you're, you're halfway through the, before you even realize. You just, yeah, that happens sometimes, okay? So, uh, but, you know, but, but, but running a red light is an idiomatic expression. If you go to Australia and tell someone that you just ran a red light, they're not going to have a clue what you're talking about because it's, it's a contextual thing. It's very uh, specific to our culture. Over there it's called running a robot. Before you guys laugh, say, that's stupid. So is running a red light. Who, how does that work? You know? But anyways, it's this thing that's very specific to us. And when Paul mentioned here this body of death, we miss this. We miss it of what he's saying here. Just like we miss, take up your cross and follow me. Because we, we, we don't downshift into the culture and understand what's happening here. But in those days, the Romans, as we know, they had the cross, which was one form of cruel punishment for those who broke the law. But there's another very cruel form of punishment was called the, the body of death. And what they would do is 
If someone committed a particularly heinous crime or, or a heinous murder, then what they would do is they would take the corpse of this person that they murdered and they would tie it to them, hands and feet, and strap it to their back and then they would throw them, abandon them out in the desert sun so that this rotting corpse would be stuck to them. And they would have, and this, and this body uh, of death would pour into them and, and they into them would become part of who they were. I, I don't know about you guys, but that's just gross, you know? That is what Paul is describing himself as. That's what he's saying. He's saying, who is going to save me from this body of death, this rotten corpse that I deserve, I brought on myself. I'm the one who, 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 who did, who committed the crime. I'm the one who deserves it. But who is going to save me from it? And I love his answer. Very simple in the next verse, in verse, in verse uh, 24. Only, obviously only through Jesus Christ. Read, read with me here. It says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. That's what we're coming to, you guys. That's the victory in Jesus Christ. I mean, here's the reality. Here's the thing. It's going to be difficult. Whenever we choose to serve God and chase after holiness, there's going to be moments of difficulty, but we have overcome through the victory in Jesus Christ that He has given us. There's going to be moments where the flesh that, that we still live within and our spirit are going to be at odds, but we have overcome. There's going to be moments when we are broken for our sin. Not just broken because we got caught or because we fell into a trap or whatever, but broken, truly broken of our sin. But Jesus Christ has brought the victory, and that's what we celebrate this morning. Amen? You guys awake up there? But this is kind of the time and the place where we have to ask ourselves, okay, so we have victory in Christ. We have, we have this victory. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be tough. We're going to be at odds with our flesh and our, and our spirit. And, and we're going to grieve over our sin. But God has given us the victory. But we have to ask ourselves a very important question. Anybody want to guess? So what? So what? So what? So we've been given the victory. What does that mean for us? How, how do we take that and apply it to our lives? I mean, don't get me wrong. That's something to celebrate, to celebrate God, the victory that God has given us. That's what Paul is doing here. You know, he's saying, uh, he's saying through God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, he's celebrating the, the victory that we receive through Christ. But here's what's really important to me, I think, and this is what happens all too often. We miss this because we say it with our mouth. But we deny it with our lives. Look at this. Back in verse 25. It says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's it. That's what we miss. We've been given the victory in Christ Jesus. But we have hearts that are full of ungratefulness. And I just want to say something about the role of thanksgiving when it comes to the victory in Christ. It's important that we thank God for His victory in Christ. Look at this in Romans chapter 1, verse 21, if you want to read with me. Romans 1, 21, it says, For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. I think that's where so many of us, we find ourselves in a place where we know who God is. We've heard about God. You can't hardly be from the South, from the Bible Belt, and not know who God is and who Jesus Christ is. We know about Him, but we don't honor Him as God. We don't thank Him. Even as believers in Christ, we live lives of ungratefulness. I know I do. When I think back on what God has done for me, what He has done in my life, the, the, simple, the simple fact of salvation, the simple fact that He has saved me from that body of death. And yet I'm so ungrateful. I lack heart of thanksgiving. You know, I think about Adam and Eve. They had everything. They had everything that they could possibly desire. Everything they needed or wanted and they weren't thankful for it. It says, and they saw the fruit and they saw it was good to eat and they ate it. 
And then they opened their eyes and they realized that they were naked and they were ashamed. Instead of being grateful for what God has given them, instead of being grateful for the amazing providence that God has given them, they found themselves in a place where it wasn't enough. They compared what they had to what they didn't have. That's, that's what we do. I mean, that's what we do, you guys, that, that we, we take, we're so, instead of being so thankful for so many of the things that God has blessed us with, you realize we have it better than every other percentage of every other country in the world. There is no country that has more, more wealth and more satisfaction, even in the midst of all, how much we complain about how our country is and how much we lack. We still have so much. We spend so much time, instead of thanking God for what He's given us, we spend time whining and griping and complaining for His providence, complaining about how He takes care of us. We, we spend so much time in pursuit of the few things that we don't have that the worst thing is we lose the things that God has given us. I, for one, that's where I find myself. On a day like Father's Day, where I, where I inwardly, you know, my son, he comes up to me this morning, and it's every morning. It, it just blows my mind. Every single time I see him, there's never a time where he's just like, what's up, Dad? You know, it's always like, Daddy! And he just comes running and jumps into my arms, and I'm telling you, it's like the best feeling ever. I'm holding on to it, because I know it's not always going to be that way. Some of you guys are like, yup. <laughs> but I hold on to that feeling, and I have to think about Am I being the father he deserves? Am I even thankful for who he is and what he means in my life? Am I thankful for the gift that he is? That my wife is? Or do I complain? Do I gripe? Do I moan? Christ has given me the victory. We were told we would never have children. And now we got two of them running around. We can't even hold them down. The victory in Christ that he's given us. And yet we find ourselves complaining and ungrateful. Anybody else in that place this morning? You want to avoid sexual immorality in your marriage? Be thankful for your spouse. Be thankful for your husband or for your wife. Instead of complaining about all the things they don't do for you, instead of complaining about all the things they don't do, God for who they are and what they've done and how they have enriched your life day in and day out. And yet that's what we spend our time thinking about, what we don't get, what we don't have. You know, God has given us these amazing opportunities to go and serve Him. To, maybe it's to go on a mission trip and just to serve around the world. Or maybe it's just to go down the street, but instead of thanking Him for this divine opportunity to serve on a mission trip, we complain about, well, I don't have the money. Or I don't have the time. Well, I don't have the energy. I'm just worn out. God has given us the victory in Christ. He gives us these divine appointments with His victory in Jesus Christ. It's already in mind. I've heard that saying before in the love. It says, what would you try if you knew, if you knew that you couldn't fail? And God gives us opportunities every single day to try. Knowing that we can't fail. He's given us the victory. He's given us the victory. He's provided everything that we have or need. He's given us every opportunity. And yet instead of embracing that, we're ungrateful. That's the so what, guys. We have the victory in Jesus Christ. Praise be to God that He has given us His victory. That God has, has resurrected us from this body of death. And just like Paul, we need to say, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's how we need to live. I don't know about you guys, but I find myself in that place, a place of ungratefulness. A place of lacking thanks for who God is and what He's done in my life. He's given me so much as a husband, as a father, as a minister of the gospel, he's given me just unparalleled opportunities, and I'm not the only one. And I know what happens when I when I uh, preach a message like this. It's really hard to think about coming down front because it's almost like the walk of shame, right? Because you're in that same place. For you to stand up and come down here and get on your face and thank God for what. 
he's done for you in your life is to admit that you haven't been thankful. I was so blessed this morning because we saw people respond. Uh, ironically, tons of men. Dads, I don't know. Maybe that's what's going on. I know that's where I find myself. This is the most amazing thing about that, though. Just like the lepers, the ten lepers that were healed by Jesus Christ, they came to him and they were healed and they went off. And in one of those ten, he stopped and he turned around and he came back to Jesus. And he said, thank you, Jesus, for healing me. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my life. Thank you, Jesus, for touching me in a way that no one else could, for saving me. And Jesus' simple response was, where are the rest? Where are we going to find ourselves this morning? Are we going to find ourselves like those other nine just going out ungrateful for what he's done in our lives? Or are we going to come to him? We're going to say thank you. 